Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Casalino. And we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel. And we're right at the beginning of David's hardest trials in his, the early times in his life. We just went through chapter 20, where Samuel had to leave his family, leave his home, leave his closest friend. He's on the run because of what the king is trying to do to him. King Saul fears David, and he's been ratcheting up attacks against him. And after chapter 20, he and Jonathan decided that David has to leave. Now, chapter 21 begins what is arguably the darkest season of David's life before becoming king. And he's going to endure some very intense situations and some things that might actually be surprising if you're not familiar with this period in David's life. In the churches, we teach about young David and Goliath and his great victories then, and then we jump to David as king. We may even talk about David and Bathsheba. We'll talk about David and his writings, his psalms, but this period of his life isn't as intensely covered. And if you're new to this story, it actually might be surprising about the things he's about to experience. Remember, years ago when I first read this, I had no idea that David would end up doing some of the things that he ended up doing. And as we're going to see in today's episode, there are a few things he does that actually might shock us as far as what we think of David and and his character and why would he do this. We're going to learn, even in the midst of these kinds of trials and difficult situations, even when David himself isn't doing everything properly, God is still with him, and we're going to see why. So clearly he's on the run. He doesn't want to go back to Bethlehem because that could easily provoke Saul to attack his family. He can't just go to any random city in Israel because the people might not know him. Plus, if they did know him and he's famous, he'll obviously get back to Saul. In other cities, they might not have people he could trust. So where is he going to go? Who can he actually go to for help? So in chapter 21, we see David going to the one place he knew would offer some measure of help as he's fleeing the nation, the tabernacle. Verse 1 begins, Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And when Ahimelech met David, he trembled, and he asked him, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? The king has given me a mission, David replied. He told me no one is to know about the mission or charge, and I have directed my young men to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. There is no common bread on hand, the priest replied, but there is some consecrated bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered, Women have indeed been kept from us, as is usual when I set out. And the equipment of the young man is holy, as it is even on common missions, and all the more at this time. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which had been removed from before the Lord and replaced with hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doag the Edomite, the chief shepherd for Saul. Okay, so what's going on here? We see David flees to a city called Nob, or Nob, which is called the city of priests later on. Ahimelech is the priest overseeing the duties of the tabernacle. And when David appears, he's terrified. So why is he reacting this way? Well, David is alone without any soldiers, without uh, riding alongside the king or anything like that. And David's well known as a commander of the army. So it's unusual that David just by himself. There's not even a mention whether he's on foot or is he on a horseback. We don't know. It's just him. And Ahimelech could have feared something was wrong. Uh, maybe he thought David was being sent to kill the priests because, you know, if you're sending someone to do something evil, you don't want to draw a lot of attention to them, so you send them by themselves. Or it's possible the priest figured out that David was on the run from the king And anyone who would help David would be in trouble. 
So because Ahimelech is unfortunately not greeting David warmly or with any kind of appropriate respect out of fear and suspicion, David decides to come up with a story to explain his unusual arrival at the tabernacle. So we have to acknowledge that you know, David is lying. The text in no way approves that David is, is deceiving the priest. David was desperate. He had no supplies, not even food. And as we often do, he rationalized this lie just to get his immediate needs met. Just a few loaves of bread just to eat, which would only last him a few days at most. But is the Bible saying this is okay? Well, of course not. Already up until this point, we've seen again and again how God provided for David, even when he was in the middle of this difficult situation. But it seems in this moment, David, who's run down, worn out, just still depressed from leaving his friends and family and and all these things, his faith would have wavered in his weakness of his flesh, he thought he had to lie. And we know he couldn't have told the priest that the king was after him. In realistic terms, he didn't know if he could trust the priest. He didn't know how this priest would react. I mean, if you told him, well, the king's trying to kill me, Ahimelech probably would have just sent him away without any help. However, this is one of the reasons why it was so wrong for David to lie. Had he simply told the truth to this man, it would have given Ahimelech a chance to do the right thing. To say, I'm going to help you even though you're in danger. That would have made Ahimelech um, righteous under these circumstances because he would have known what was going on. And even in, even in the fact that he would be in danger by helping David, he would have done the right thing. So from, a, from God's perspective, had David been honest, Ahimelech would have had a chance to do something righteous. Instead, because David lies... Ahimelech is helping him out of ignorance. He, Ahimelech wasn't making a choice. Should I help David and risk my life? Or should I send David away and protect my own skin? He didn't have that choice because he didn't know what was really going on. Instead, he helps him based on the pretense of a lie. And so Ahimelech isn't really doing anything right or wrong. In fact, he's now participating in a, in a form of sin because David is lying. And as we see later on, this doesn't bode well for the city of Nob. So there's never a good time to lie. When you lie, you're depriving other people from the opportunity to do the right thing. And you're making them, to a certain extent, complicit in your sin. But David thinks he needs to quickly lie just to get what he he needs and continue on in his journey. So he's operating in this moment in his natural fleshly understanding. Instead of continuing in the faith that has always marked his integrity. The big challenge that we have is is if we grew up with a very Sunday school understanding of God's nature, we would think that God would be displeased at David at this moment, and because of this sin, he would not help David, and God's not going to be with someone who lies and sins. And we know biblically it's wrong to lie. It's a sin. But why is the text here silent about David's lie? Why is there no... A consequence from God? Why doesn't God not rebuke David for this sin? In fact, it doesn't seem like God is upset with David for taking this bread and doing this. And many years later, Jesus talks about this story in the Gospels, but in a completely different context. We read about this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus replied, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread along with his companions, which was not lawful for them to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath, and yet are innocent. But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If only you had known the meaning of, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So we see in this text, Jesus doesn't even bring up the fact that David had lied to the priest. 
In fact, he's using this story as an example to defend his disciples who, in the Pharisees' minds, were breaking the Sabbath by picking up some grain and eating it. The Pharisees were outraged because they considered that work on a day that forbade work. But Jesus says in Mark, uh, in this, the example in Mark, he says that the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. The Sabbath was made to be a blessing to Israel, not some sort of burden where they couldn't literally pick up some food from the ground and eat it. But the Jewish leaders of that day had turned something good from God into almost like a curse or a burden. God's law was meant to be a blessing to Israel, but the rabbinical traditions that had developed over time made them into nothing more than painful rituals and rules. But why did Jesus reference this story from 1 Samuel 21? David defied priestly rules to eat bread that was only supposed to go to the priests. In the minds of religious Jews, that was a bigger sin than David lying to the priest. You see, the bread that the priest gave him was provided for the priests in the holy place as they were serving. According to the law, they had to have this bread provided. It was called the bread of presence or the showbread. It was put on this special table inside the tabernacle so that as the priests were busy, they spent all day working in the tabernacle. They weren't going to go and find bread for themselves. They weren't going to go and make bread for themselves. They were holy. Holy means they were devoted to the Lord. And their life and their time was best spent serving him. There's a lot going on in the tabernacle. Even Jesus says the priests work on the Sabbath in the tabernacle because there's a whole lot they need to do. They're offering up sacrifices. They're burning incense. They're ministering to the people of Israel who are continually coming to them, seeking for their help in worshiping God. So they couldn't just go out and grab some bread. So they had, God had provided bread for them. Every day it would be made by Levites or other members working in the temple, and they would provide it for the priests. And when the priests were hungry, they would eat from it. So we see this bread was provided by God for people serving the Lord. But what happens is that in the minds of a very strict, legalistic person, that means this bread's only for the priests. So if David came along and was in need, No, he's not allowed to eat that. He's not a priest. He's not working the tabernacle. But yet that bread was made for a follower of the Lord in need, who was faithfully serving God. So they wouldn't have to be burdened with, oh, where am I going to find food? So they could be completely devoted to serving the Lord. And that principle actually is applicable in the New Testament. Paul writes about this in 1 and 2 Corinthians, talking about those who have devoted their lives to the gospel and serving the church shouldn't have to worry about their financial needs, which is why it's biblical to support pastors and teachers and leaders in the church who are devoting their full-time job as pastors. But think of David. Yeah, he wasn't a priest, but he was anointed by God to be the next king. And his whole life was devoted to serving God. He was a man after God's own heart. And in that moment, he wasn't fleeing Saul because of some crime he committed. He wasn't sinning. He was serving God, being obedient. So if that's not a person devoted to the Lord, who is? So that bread was just as appropriately given to David than anyone else. But if you have a very narrow uh, viewpoint that strains over rules and ignores what Jesus said, mercy over sacrificial rituals, you won't understand that at all. Jesus was explaining that the ritualistic laws were meant to bless and help Israel, not become a burden. Jesus wasn't even concerned with David lying. Does Jesus ignore lying? Of course not. But notice what Jesus said. He said there were companions with David. We would have thought that was a lie. Remember, he said, oh, the men are over here somewhere, and I'm here by myself. But Jesus said he had companions with him. So maybe it wasn't entirely a lie. The main concern was that we are using God's word and law appropriately to help those in need, instead of using God's word to deny people when they're in need. That doesn't excuse sin. That doesn't excuse disobedience. What that does is separate true sin 
from uh, religious legalism. David did not sin because he ate the priestly bread. That bread was meant to bless God's people. The disciples weren't sinning because they were picking up heads of grain and rubbing them to get the food out and eating them. Because the Sabbath wasn't meant to prevent people from feeding themselves. It was meant to be a blessing. But sadly, the Pharisees at this time and the other religious leaders of Israel cared more about the stringent rules that they created rather than serving their own people. The priests were not breaking God's law by giving David this bread. In fact, they were fulfilling the law, which said, love your neighbor as yourself. David was in need. He was a fellow Israelite. Give him the bread. We'll make more. See, that is mercy over sacrifice, ritualistic uh, adherence to rules. And that's the big uh, message we need to take away from what Jesus is teaching from this story. It's very easy as Christians to fall into the same trap. But are we loving people, showing them mercy instead of clinging to our ritualistic, legalistic rules that only condemn people when they fall. And that's something we need to think about. Of course, you might still be stuck on the fact that David lied. And we need to make it clear that neither 1 Samuel, nor Matthew, nor any other book that references his story condones David lying. As I said previously, it has negative consequences. But here, Jesus, in this story, he's not condemning David for that, nor in the book of Samuel is David rebuked or condemned for it. So does that mean God overlooks actual sin just because someone's in need? Should we say, well, well, the need's great, so let's just put aside all these morals, you know, what really matters is helping people. That's not what the Bible teaches. Because you could stretch that into saying we could do whatever we want, as long as we really, really needed it. And that's not morality. That's not biblical morality. That's not God's righteousness. It never changes, even when we're in difficult times. Nor did Jesus say that. But what this episode does teach us is that even when we fail, God is still with us. So the reality is, you sin every day. And if God was really helping you based on your moral perfection, you wouldn't be doing really well right now. Unfortunately, we are conditioned to think that God blesses us, but only when we perfectly obey every rule in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying you should look for loopholes. When we live in accordance with God's word, we experience good things. But God is showing you favor in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, not because you are perfectly able to obey everything in the Bible. Like I said, if that were the case, we'd all be in big trouble. In fact, we'd all be dead by now. God shows us favor because of our faith in his word, not in our works. And that faith even is something that God put in our hearts. Okay, that is what the Bible calls grace. It's undeserved favor. Romans 4, 3 says this, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We do not earn God's favor because of what we can do with our own strength and talent or effort. God freely gives us his favor because of what he has done for us through Jesus Christ on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So grace is undeserved favor from God. You can't earn it. You can't lose it when you screw up. This means God will help us all the time, even when we are wrong. Now, how is that possible? Does that mean God rewards our sin? No, of course not. It means that God is good, and we are totally dependent on Him all the time for Him to provide for us. If it were up to us, we'd we'd be lost. We'd be dead by now. But God shows us favor and continually provides for us even when we're less than perfect because He is a good God 
and he's a gracious God. Now, remember, this is not an invitation to sin. Sin does not magnify God's grace. We are weak enough as we are in need of God's grace without sinning. But when we do sin, when we do fall, God is still providing for us. That is because the grace we have in him was provided through Jesus Christ's suffering on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. That is what provides us with salvation and a continued relationship with God, which produces this grace and favor that we need. In other words, Jesus died to release God's favor to us. So even when we mess up, he still provides. And that was even true for David. We may look at David and say, that was the Old Testament. How could it be that he would have that same kind of favor? Well, the principle is still there. God is faithful to his people even when we fall short. And this episode shows us that even when David is less than honest, God is still making sure to provide for him. If you think about it in practical terms, if you have a parent taking care of his child, even when the child does something wrong, the parent doesn't suddenly say, all right, I'm not taking care of you anymore. Get out of my house. Get your stuff, you're out. And he kicks a five-year-old out of the house because he didn't, you know, do his chores. Is that what a loving parent does? No. A loving parent continues to love and take care of his child, even when the child is disobedient. Now, a loving parent will also correct and teach the child so they understand that what was wrong, so they won't do it again. But the love never disappears. The father continues to take care of the child even when he messes up. The same is true for our Heavenly Father. Even with David in the Old Testament, God had made a promise to David to make him king. And even though he's in this very dark, difficult season, God's not going to break his promise. God doesn't break promises. It's impossible for him to do it. What he said he'll do, he's going to do. And he said, when Samuel anointed David, that was God saying, you will be the next king. You are my anointed. That's not going to go away. God made a promise to David, and it was going to happen. So even in this moment, when David is stumbling by lying, God is still going to be faithful. And in some way, in the future, God's going to correct him for this flaw. And in the future, as we see, there are times where David does something wrong and God steps in and corrects him. There's actually multiple instances of that in First and Second Samuel, some big, some small, because that is how God is. So we need to take this and apply it to our own life. We are living lives in a difficult world, surrounded by sin and darkness. You might be going through a really difficult challenge right now in your life, could be your physical life. It could be in a relationship, it could be with your job or finances. Whatever it is, you might think in your head, well, if I do everything perfectly, then God will be happy with me and he'll get me out of this trial. But that's not how it works. Of course, you need to search God's word and see what the Bible says about your circumstance. There might be some small thing or big thing that you should be doing that can help you in your difficulty. But that's not what's going to get you what you need. It's the Lord who's going to provide what you need because of his grace through Jesus Christ. Scripture says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say in his riches and glory in your ability to obey his word perfectly. And if you mess up, see you later doesn't say that. So when we are in a need, and we're all in need, I don't care if you're young or old, if you're rich, if you're not so rich, if you're smart or not so smart, you have needs in your life. So when you go to the Lord asking him for those needs, 
Be confident that he is going to provide, not because you've said your prayers and you read your Bible for an hour a day and you gave money to your church and you witnessed to your neighbors and you did all these little Christian things you thought you needed to do. Now you come before the God and now you are right with God and he could answer your prayer. That's not how it works. He's going to provide for you because of his grace, because you received Jesus Christ in your heart, which was a gift. You are now a child of God, and God is not in the business of abandoning his children. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even if you screw up a hundred times in a day, a hundred times he will forgive you, and he will provide for you. If it was true for David, it's true for us today. We see at verse 7, there's this little footnote. Someone named Doeg was there, and he noticed what happened. And we'll find out later on the consequences of this essentially spy in what he does. And we'll see what happens next with David, where he goes to next. David's about to take a very unexpected turn in his life, but as we've seen, God will be with him. This has been the Lightning Podcast. Check us out, lightningpodcast.org. Also see us on Facebook.